Hello. Welcome to worship at North Decatur United Methodist Church. If we have not yet met, my name is Edry and I'm the part-time minister of visitation here on staff. There are some activities through church that might spark your interest. And there are some small groups that still have room for you. One is a conversation on 1 Thessalonians and the most recent sermon. That group meets on Tuesday evenings. Right after this worship time, there is a time of prayer, fellowship, and accountability. Both are good groups that would welcome you. There is also a group exploring helping coping strategies, which meets on Wednesday evenings. They too would welcome your presence. Sign-ups for these are on the church's website. There are some service opportunities offered and some anti-racist readings on the church's website that are definitely worth checking out. Lenten group studies and conversations are coming up mid-February. One is a study of the Enneagram, and one is learning to see about our biases, and I have a spoiler alert for that one. There are 13 biases explored, and they all begin with the letter C. And we would really like to know who is with us online today. So please fill out the connect card you can reach by scrolling down a bit. Or you could leave a comment or a prayer request in the chat function on your screen. And while we're thinking about the chat function on your screen, I have a starter question for you to ponder or respond that will hopefully fold in with Patrick's sermon. When has the church gotten it wrong when talking about relationships? Let the worship begin.
Hey friends, uh, I invite you to join in this prayer. May these words be our shared words together. Let us pray. God of overflowing compassion. When we slow down, we often recognize just how rough we are on ourselves and on others. We do not treat ourselves kindly. We don't give ourselves grace. We're slow to forgive ourselves. And this much is doubly true for others in our lives, some of whom we find annoying or in the way or against us. And God, together as a collected people, we just recognize that this is part of your beauty, is that you find us in this space and you overwhelm us with your compassion, your love for us, your insistence that we are loved as we are, your insistence that other people are good and are worthy of wholeness and of love your insistence that we sometimes be made uncomfortable or thrown off our routines or out of our habits to consider our concern for others. You envelop us in your compassion and invite us along for the journey. And it's for this reason and for so many other reasons that you are truly worthy of our worship. God, as we enter into this space, we just for a moment recognize all that we hold on to in our own selves and we bring them to you. And we lift up all of those in our community who we wish to care for in a better way. We lift up those who are lonely in this time. May they feel our warmth and our comfort. We pray for those who are grieving. Those who don't see hope in this time. We pray for those who are sick, that they might find comfort and healing. We pray for those who do not have shelter that they might find security and safety, that we might be moved to, to action to ensure those for them. And we pray for our society. We pray that justice and peace might be things that are not just ideals, but that which we practice fluently and abundantly. In the ways in which we do not help build up your kingdom, please forgive us. Please invite us into a better way. And please give us the strength to be instruments of your justice and your peace in this world. All of this and so much more we lift to you. in the hopes that your compassion leads us forward into building that very kingdom of God all around us. This we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, friends. It's Bible time with Miss Brittany and friends. A special time just for you. Are you ready? Gather round. was she said it was broken and she threw it away rude uh, well was it broken i mean yes i poked a hole in it by accident but still i hope i don't break my arm she'd probably throw me away i think you're just saying that because you're upset i mean a person and a whoopee cushion they're very different for one thing People are alive, and our bodies can heal if we get broken. I'm sure it was a really good whoopee cushion, but it wasn't going to get better. Probably not. That would be so 
cool. A, a self-healing whoopee cushion. And Miss Brittany was just telling me the other day how the Bible teaches us not to treat each other as if we were things. See? It's it's right here in verse 6 of Thessalonians. Thess Thessalonians. No one should mistreat or take advantage of their brothers and sisters. You're right, Ollie. I know my mom would never throw me away, even if I was broken. She loves me, and she never treats me like a toy or something. Yeah. Hi, friends. Wow. Amelia was so mad at me. And I can understand why. It's hard not to have the things that we want or to be able to get what we want from other people. I'm so glad that Ollie was there to talk to her. And Ollie was right. Our scripture verse this week reminds us that we need to keep trying to be better in how we live, especially in the ways that we treat one another. Sometimes when we really want something, it's easy to be mean to the people around us to blame them for not giving us what we want at the exact moment that we want it. Paul is reminding the Thessalonians to keep trying to be better in how they live, especially in how they treat each other. That is something that we can all do. As Christians, as people that follow Jesus in order to be in relationship with God and with each other, we can always be better in how we love God and each other. Until next time, may the peace of Christ and the love of God go with you. Bye! Hi friends! Won't you join me now in reading our scripture today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. So then, brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus to keep living the way you already are and even do better in how you live and please God, just as you learned from us. You know the instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. God's will is that your lives are dedicated to Him. This means that you stay away from sexual immorality and learn how to control your body in a pure and respectable way. Don't be controlled by your sexual urges like the Gentiles who don't know God. No one should mistreat or take advantage of their brothers or sisters in this issue. The Lord punishes people for all these things, as we told you before and sternly warned you. God didn't call us to be immoral, but to be dedicated to Him. Therefore, whoever rejects these instructions isn't rejecting a human authority. They are rejecting God, who gives His Holy Spirit to you. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. When I was a kid, um, <laughs> I used to be terrified that I prayed wrong. I used to be so worried about it. I remember, I've mentioned this before in other services, but I, I remember like staying up at night, trying to make sure that I had like Psalm 23 memorized um, because I thought otherwise God would be disappointed with me if I didn't have the Bible memorized. And I remember playing games in Sunday school where all the other kids were really good at memorizing scripture and I, I just wasn't, I'm not good at memorizing things. It's never been a gift of mine. Um, and I remember feeling like such a failure that I couldn't memorize all of the scripture that my friends could and couldn't recall it quickly when we were playing uh, games when I was growing up. I remember feeling so nervous about that. And I remember being up late at night even trying to like just constantly go through prayers like the sinner's prayer, right? Like um, I want to make sure that I'm saying it right because the last thing I want to do is to end up end up in hell if I said it wrong, right? I just remember that being so, like, so scary and so nerve-wracking and so um, hard. I remember just being really scared that I got the words wrong. So I would repeat over and over and over, you know, something to the effect of, like, God, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry and I mess up all the time. Please help. Please fix me. And then, you know, I would think 
okay, I think I did it right that time, and then I'd make a mistake again, and I'd be like, oh my gosh, I must have done the prayer wrong, because it was supposed to, supposed to fix me. I'm not supposed to be a sinner anymore, and so then I'd say it again, and I'd worry because nothing seemed to be happening, because the way that, and I don't think this was necessarily the um, pastor or the church's fault. What I absorbed growing up was that um, in order to feel safe, in order to feel like God loved me, I needed to get the words right first. I think there's a lot of Christianity that is sort of built on that idea, right? Like if you just, if you would just but say the words, um, then God would come to your aid. Uh, you know, whatever you ask of the, of your heart, God will be there. And so like all these sort of scripture passages and lessons, like I took them so concretely that um, when I, you know, prayed to God for something and then nothing happened, I would feel like I was doing it wrong or that God wasn't listening. And, you know, that can really easily lead down a path where just faith is completely lost. But that's, I think that's because, I, I, I don't want to blame the Enlightenment totally, but I, I want to blame it a little bit, that the idea that um, words and statements and um, well-articulated arguments are the way to demonstrate truth was something sort of handed down to me generationally. The idea of saying the right thing, especially in church, was sort of lifted up as a, as a real marker of what it means to be Christian. And again, I don't, I don't blame the pastor for that. I don't blame any Sunday school teachers. I don't, certainly don't blame my parents, um, for goodness sakes. Uh, if there were two people who demonstrated love more um, consistently, I don't know them, but uh, it just was what I took in from the church for some reason um, that I needed to say the right thing and then everything would be okay. And when things weren't okay, then it must mean that I didn't say the right thing. And I see that all the time, you know, when, you know, not during the pandemic, but when I was able to visit folks in the hospital, a lot of times it came back to that, like, I need to pray for the right thing and then maybe healing will come. If I just promise this to God, then maybe God will be, will be there. If I, you know, it's like a deal, deal making um, with, with God. And in times of grief, I totally understand that because part of the problem in the church, I think, is that we don't do a very good job of diving deep. We stay on the surface so often and we stay in our heads so often. And again, I don't even know that that's the church's fault. I think that's just a product of living in a modern and postmodern and post-postmodern world. We think with our heads, and it's a lot harder to embody those thoughts internally. And especially when there's a discontinuity between what we're experiencing and what we're saying, it can be really hard to blend those two things together. And so I think the church, we have, we have a lot of work to do to take all of our ideas about faith, the idea that God loves all people, the idea that Christ is redeeming the world, the idea that the world is redeemable, the idea that I am redeemable, like those are all really beautifully stated value sets, but a lot of the times our actions don't demonstrate that, right? God so loved the world and yet we live with hatred for one another. Um, God loves me, and yet I struggle to love me. God creates everything that in exists in the world around us, and yet we keep building bigger and bigger and wider and wider and larger and larger things. That need more and more and more and more and more. And then, you know, we live on the edge of a great extinction with bugs and birds and so many other creatures that coral reefs dying around us all the time, right? Like God so loved the world and yet we struggle to do that. And oftentimes the church is at the forefront of saying like, we don't need to worry about that, right? The church 
often has been at the front of the line saying, you know, all lives matter, when the reality that needs to be stated is that Black Lives Matter. The church has been on the front of saying, like, you know, LGBTQ people aren't um, following in God's will, and yet God claims them as children, right? There's a lot of discontinuity between the idea of who God is as described to us in the Bible and then the way that we interact with one another based on what we read in the Bible, it's really confusing. And it's really no wonder why the church is struggling to maintain relevance or to um, be an active part of the community discourse in the world, because we say a lot of things and then we do things that seem to counteract a lot of those beliefs and ideas. And y'all, that's been a problem for a long time and it will continue to be a problem, but it doesn't mean that we can't address it. And I think the best way for us to address that discontinuity between what we say and what we do, the discontinuity between what we believe and what we actively live out, can be narrowed by looking at some of the lives of people who've been able to align their lives around their values. First and primary in my mind is this community that Paul was writing to in Thessalonica in the first century. You know, we've talked about this before, but if you're just catching up really briefly, Paul spent only three weeks with them before he was run out of town by a mob of people um, calling for him to be executed. So he spoke for three weeks, and then he left to travel down the coast of Greece and um, visit another community. And from that place, he sent a friend of his, a sort of mentee, back up to Thessalonica to check and see how they were doing. Because again, the assumption would be that within three weeks, there wouldn't be enough time for people to really devote themselves to a new way of life. And I think Paul kind of assumed that. So he sent his, um, his mentee, his friend, Timothy, up to sort of check on them and see how, th how they were doing. And when Timothy came back and reported on that city of Thessalonica back to Paul, he was raving about how beautifully they had been embodying their faith in Christ that it went, you know, beyond words and affirmations, but because of their um, absolute devotion to a new way of life offered to them um, by Paul, but really through Christ, they were experiencing persecution, they were experiencing alienation, they were experiencing um, a lot that led to some significant suffering within the community, and so Paul writes them a really encouraging letter telling them, one, how proud he is and how amazed he is that people are getting to know Christ and getting to understand what the kingdom of God is simply because they're alive. And that is, that's really key, and we're going to circle back to that. But Paul writes several really beautiful things about um, how they've been living out their lives, and then he offers some really simple instruction to those same folks, really just helping them live more and more and more through uh, their values as, as new Christians. So I said I wanted to circle, circle back to it. The, the people in Thessalonica, Paul was um, incredibly proud of them because they had been living their lives, living their lives in such a way that demonstrated that they believed in the resurrection of Christ. And that's such an important distinction, right? The Thessalonians, at least as far as scripture tells us, are not proclaiming their belief. They're not trying to convert people. They're not going out and preaching. They're not doing all this stuff. That's at least not written in scripture. Maybe they were. But what Paul writes to them in the letter about is their commitment in their lives to live a radically different way than the rest of their city, the rest of their neighbors, the rest of their family members. They had devoted their lives to something different. They hadn't talked about how they wanted to devote their lives to something different. They hadn't, you know, preached about how other people should transform their lives. They just lived a transformed life. And it was so different than the culture around them that they were experiencing persecution. And that's so key, right? Like, so much of the idea of evangelism is about, like, 
in a flawed way, like don't hear me advocating for this, but so much of evangelism is about like telling people they need to get their life right so that God will accept them in the afterlife. When really the message from Paul and the message that the Thessalonians live out is that like we all need to orient our lives to step into the kingdom of God because it is being built now and God has created a space for every single one of us. We simply need to step our feet into the kingdom. And in order to do that, we need to embody the fruits of the spirit. We need to live, learn how to live with genuine love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control. Those seven things, those seven fruits, if we can learn to live from those, uh, those values, those, that ethic, um, then the world around us will be transformed because it is radically different than the world around us. And, and that is what Paul is really trying to hammer home for these Thessalonian people. He doesn't tell them they need to do a better job of, you know, working on their rhetorical style or that they need to be better about talking about Jesus or anything like that. He says you need to live as though you are under the lordship of Christ even more fully. And he gives specific instruction to a specific community. And um, I want to read them again. Brittany already read them, but they're a little, they've been used poorly, which means that they read a little heavy. Uh, God's will is that you, that your lives are dedicated to him. Get it? Like not just your thought processes, but your lives are dedicated to him. This means that you stay away from sexual immorality. We're going to talk about that. So hold on to that. Stay away from sexual immorality and learn how to control your own body in a pure and respectable way. Don't be controlled by your sexual urges like the Gentiles who don't know God. No one should mistreat or take advantage of their brother or sister in this issue. That last sentence provides context for the whole point. It, it, First Thessalonians and other passages out of Paul's letters have been used really poorly uh, to describe what sexual morality is. The church nor Paul is really interested in defining what that means. What it does mean for us, if we're going to live from a value set oriented towards the kingdom of God, is that we cannot treat other people as things for our own pleasure. That is at the heart of what Paul is talking about as it relates to sexual immorality, because the, the Greek word there is pornea, the, you know, uh, use of another person for our own erotic pleasure. That is bad. <laughs> That's not the point of romantic relationship. That's not the point of covenant relationship. And the more often we treat one another as things, the more we start thinking of one another as things. And the more we start thinking about one another as things, the less we are able to see them as beloved children in the way that God sees them. So the best way to live from a kingdom mindset, the best way to live out the values associated with God and Christ is to stop doing anything that makes us think of any person as a thing. And extending from that, we should never think of any part of God's creation as a thing for our own pleasure. Instead, we should learn to live with one another through genuine, genuine pursuit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control. And Paul is addressing a very specific issue in Thessalonica here and really helping them to understand what it means to live through a life oriented in love and a life oriented through self-control. Being able to live using both of those pieces of our faith life to say no person should be a thing for you. All people should be received as, should be celebrated as a beloved child of God because scripture and Christ both tell us that that is the fundamental truth. All of the world, every person within it is a child created for a unique purpose within God's kingdom. And anytime we rob another person of that value, 
we are stepping outside of the kingdom of God and participating in something counter to the work that God is doing. So Paul is reminding the people in Thessalonica that they have some work to continue to do. They're doing amazing. Their lives are oriented towards God. The community is starting to notice that they're living very differently than everyone else in the neighborhood. They are experiencing, they're, they're suffering at the hands of others, and yet they're maintaining their commitment to live in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control. And it's bizarre to their community, but it's transforming the community at the same time. The thing that they have to work on now is to learn how to work through sexuality as a community in such a way that they can treat one another as beloved children through love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control. And so we, as people of faith living in the 21st century, have to ask the same questions. How have we used other people as things? And then we need to confess that, we need to repent of that, and we need to live further in to God's kingdom. So there's a lot of work for us to do. And it's going to take a lot of time because the fruits of the Spirit, as simple as they are to name, are incredibly difficult to live into. But that is the work that we are called to, all of us, every single one of us. As you all know, I am far from perfect here, um, so we we're, are we're, on this walk together, and I, I'm grateful for that. So uh, let's affirm our faith together. Um, by going through a creed which we wrote together as a congregation um, in 2019. So uh, let's affirm our faith through it, and then let's learn how to embody those beliefs that we named together. Uh, let's do that now. I believe in the triune God who creates all things and calls them good. Even when loving or trusting God is hard, God provides for us. Even when loving or trusting ourselves is hard, God loves us as we are. I believe in the incarnation and in the God of Jesus Christ. Even when humanity seems hopelessly flawed, Christ becomes human in Jesus, the Son of Mary. Jesus lived among us, broke bread with us, taught us, and healed us. Jesus was crucified by those in power and rejected by his closest friends. Jesus overcame the power of sin and death to draw us to resurrection alongside him. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who enlivens us and sustains all creation. Even when we are brokenhearted and the way ahead seems unsure, the Spirit of God comforts us and directs us. Even when pride discourages our curiosity, the Spirit invites us into mystery. God is known among us as we read scripture, attuned to the traditions of the faithful, ask big questions, and experience God's presence in new ways through community and solitude. We trust that God works through us to transform the world through love and service. God is with us. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God, amen. I love that affirmation so much. I love that at the very front of it, we name all of those truths that God is a God who creates out of a sense of love and that Christ has come to redeem the world and that the Spirit continues to work within our lives, bringing comfort, but also accountability to us in times of, of greatest need. And I'm, I'm just, I'm so grateful um, for your energy and helping to affirm that and to name that. Y'all wrote that creed. Anybody who was a part of the church in 2019 was a part of writing that. So um, I just think it's so beautiful. And they're so, those statements are so aspirational and beloved and loving. And I'm just so grateful. Um, and that's true of so many aspects of our ministry together. Um, we continue to rely on you to maintain the health of our church. We're genuinely in this together. So all the time that you spend in pursuit of God, all the time that you spend reading scripture and sitting in small groups and discussing with friends and um, in prayer and, and all of the money that you give and all of the time that you spend and all of the work that you do is all 
for the benefit of the kingdom of God through our little corner of the world here physically on North Decatur and Church Street, but um, also extending to exactly the place that you sit right now. So I'm so grateful for you, and I hope that you will continue to live uh, your life more and more and more oriented to this kingdom. And as you have the finances, I hope that you will continue to give generously. Um, but through it all, despite whatever circumstance we may be in, uh, there is always one thing that remains. And so I invite you to sing our closing song before we depart for today. One thing remains. As a hint, it is God's love, which never fails, never gives up, and never runs out. And we have that to be grateful for. Amen. Let's sing. I'm so grateful for the work that our musicians and our praise team and especially Sandra has done to make these services come together, especially with music that is so perfectly appropriate um, for each Sunday, helping us all to orient our hearts and our lives more and more and more towards God's kingdom being built in us, among us, and beyond us. Um, you now, I think that's about it for today, and so um, I invite you to depart uh, from this time in sure and certain abundance of God's love for you. Because it's true. God created you, named you, knew you before you were born, and loves you even to this day through it all. I hope that you can learn to live through that truth. And in the same way as you learn to know yourself as a beloved child of God, I hope 
that you can translate that to the beloved child that exists within each and every person. There's not a single person who's been born to this earth that is not a child of God. And the more we're able to affirm that, acknowledge that, and celebrate that, the more the kingdom will become apparent to us. So good luck. Not every person, including myself, is easy to love all the time. Um, but that therein is the work. So go in peace and love. Amen.